Hello everyone, my name is Mike and we're back again with another history reaction video, this time to Oversimplified and due to somebody suggesting it, this is Henry VIII's video. So we're going to be checking this out. Uh, Henry VIII is probably one of the more well-known English monarchs. I think just not just in England, but I think generally speaking, if you say Henry VIII, most people understand fat bloke had a bunch of wives, killed some of them. Um, yeah, so Henry VIII, well-known. Personally speaking, not one of my favourites, although he is incredibly important in English history. I think there's some monarchs that are a bit more interesting or, you know, fun to learn about. Maybe it's because they're not spoken about as much like um, Richard the Lionheart or the Hammer of the Scots, Edward. And, you know, the latter one also being, if any fans out there for Clash of Kings or uh, Game of Thrones, Edward, um, Edward I, Hammer of Scots, is widely the inspiration behind Tywin Lannister. So if you like Tywin Lannister, you might like the kind of character of him. You know, an incredibly kind of harsh, hard and cruel man, but also incredibly cunning and intelligent in equal measure. But that's not about them. We're talking about Henry VIII today. And so I can only imagine what we're going to be talking about. And so I'm going to speculate probably the War of the Roses, or at least I hope it does, because I think War of the Roses is one of the most interesting parts of English history. Up there with the other civil wars, generally speaking. Uh, the other civil wars of England are incredibly interesting. But the War of the Rose particularly, I mean, widely speculated to be the inspiration of Game of Thrones itself. And the type of political intrigue and stuff like that that was involved in there would make Game of Thrones look like a children's cartoon. Um, but, you know, so Hen uh, the Henry VIII video, I assume, is going to talk about the War of the Roses. If it doesn't, then I certainly will. And I can only apologise for that because that might end up as a little bit of a lecture but i'm also assuming that obviously he's going to talk about his wives talk about the dissolution of the monastery and the kind of foundation of the church of england that's what i'm imagine probably going to cover and as always the bits they are oversimplified then i'm going to try and fill in the gaps where i can where i know i can but without further ado let's get into the video and as always please link will be in the description check out the oversimplified guys subscribe to them give them a like wherever they're the ones who make these cracking videos i'm just some idiot who's talking about them in my kitchen. So, without further ado, let's begin. This video was made possible by Honey. Keep watching to find out how you can save money when you shop online. Also, the reviews are in. That's some nice merch. Get your brand new character pin, limited time face mask, and more. Link down below. Blah. Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Tell me, was I a good king? Uh, you were okay. Will I be remembered as the great warrior king who invaded France, revolutionized English healthcare, and developed great parklands? Um, uh. probably not. Because of the wife killings? Because of the wife killings. <laughs> Sigmund, how did I get here? I still remember the good old days when I was a boy with a heart full of fire. And mummy would teach me. Okay, Henry, this is a horse. Can you say horse? Ho, ho, divorce. Oh. What? No. Okay, let's try this one. Can you say loaf of bread? L loaf with her head. No, Henry, that's wrong. You know what? Last one. Okay. Can you say soap? Soap. S -s -s yes, that's it. Uh, I'm the supreme head of the church. Screw the Pope. You know what? You're my son and I love you, but you're freaking weird, man. So I think given that my estimation of what the video might talk about might be quite correct, the uh, the separation from church, uh, the divorce, of course, and the uh, wife killing. Um, but yeah. The year is 1491. England has just come out of three decades of civil war in which a bunch of Henrys, Edwards, and one Richard had a little ding-dong over which royal house should rule the realm. Finally, a Henry won, Henry the Seventh, and he had a son. What should we name him? My royal lineage is full of Henrys. A fine name, a vigorous name, a tenacious name, a muscular name. How about Arthur? And so Arthur, Prince of Wales and next in line to the throne, was born. Okay. So, apologies for what's about to happen, but I'm about to go over the War of the Roses. So... One Richard had a... So I'm back, sorry, a little minor interruption there, but we're back, and yeah, so apologies for this. This is going to get a little bit luxury, but I'm going to try and make it as swift and oversimplified as I can 
in my own right while still providing the details uh, because the War of the Roses is a period of history that I feel like so few people know about and yet it's so interesting, it's so, well it's not great, I was about to say great, but it's incredibly interesting, it's incredibly influential of English history and you know the the kind of political and diorama of this whole situation is well i don't think it's comparable to a lot of things that have happened so generally speaking starting at the beginning the short version of why it's called the war of the roses is because it's joined to the white rose of york and the red rose of lancaster hence the war of the roses and both these houses uh, claimed the throne through descent of edward the third now, the Lancastrians have been on the throne since the end of the 14th century, so you know, 1390s. But the 15th century had some incredibly interesting things take place. So, for one, Henry V died. And, you know, Henry V, when you think of Henry V, Agincourt, wars with France and such like that. And he was replaced by Henry VI. The problem was, the kingdom at this time was kind of being managed by the king's council. And the easiest way to think of this was kind of like a core of aristocracy but the problem was you had lots of incredibly powerful men all with different aspirations and you know different motives and so the king's council became a political battleground really for these groups and these powerful men with various factions popping up and all trying to vie for power it's a very game of thrones-esque and uh, again the game of thrones was based on the war of the roses and so while this vying for power was happening, one particular man, or house really, when you think about it, is Richard of York. Now, they were growing in immense strength. And when Henry VI temporarily went insane, Richard of York was installed as protector of the realm. The problem with this is when Henry VI then recovered, he gave his authority back to his wife, Queen Margaret, who had links to France. This then forced York into taking up arms to protect himself because by by instating his wife's authority, it was a kind of a direct kind of clash with York himself. And so this started the War of the Roses. And it was a relatively short start to the war because the Yorkists won the first battle and this kind of led to a, a truce of uh, about four years uh, following the Yorkists' victory. However, things weren't necessarily that simple because you need to think about it. If you've watched Game of Thrones or have read the books, the easiest way to think of it is Queen Margaret is kind of a Cersei character, only without the incest. So while the truce is happening, Queen Margaret has made it no secret that she hates York and she is planning to attack him. And so as the truce is coming to an end, York himself rebels and the war ignites again. And the two sides trade victories and battles here and there, up and down the country. And the purging of political opposition is something, as I said, that would make Game of Thrones look like a children's cartoon. Something that a child would read. Because both sides, completely without mercy and indiscriminately, purged whatever opposition they could. Or whatever opposition they thought would potentially be opposition and now these could be people involved in the conflicts fighting in either sides and they'd have their entire family killed root and stem and you'd have other people who were just barely related to the opposition parties and they and their entire family would be murdered you know incredibly brutal and merciless killings from both sides just simply to consolidate and wipe out the opposition wherever you can and as the war's progressing Richard of York proposes that he's got an idea he would have peace on the terms that he would inherit the throne of England after Henry VI dies. But Queen Margaret is vehemently against this because if they sign the terms that Richard of York would inherit the throne after Henry VI dead, then that means that their son wouldn't have, you know, they, they would he would be disinherited from the crown entirely. And so the war continued. And eventually, this led to Richard of York himself being killed. Now, York had a son called Edward. And while the war was going on, uh, London was being besieged. And Edward marched and was able to get there with a relief army and uh, relieve the city of London, where he himself was crowned in 
Western in Westminster Abbey as King Edward the Fourth. And hearing this news and various other victories happening around the place, this forced Henry the Sixth, his wife, and their son to then flee to Scotland. There's a lot of going back and forth here, so bear with me. And then. While the war is still continuing in the north, but it's no way in full swing as it was in the years previously. And while Henry VI and the Queen and stuff like that are in exile from England, essentially, the Lancastrian party is almost virtually destroyed. Wherever a family member or a supporter or a potential supporter could be found, they were rooted out, you know, completely stripped from society, executed, imprisoned, tortured, wherever they could to wipe out opposition, they did. And the Lancastrian party, as it was known, almost ceased to exist entirely. Complete consolidation of York's power. And this led to eventually Henry VI getting himself captured and then later imprisoned in the Tower of London. Now, you might be thinking things are going well for the Yorkists here. Yeah, you know, you got Edward IV is in power, you have you know, his major rival, Henry VI, is imprisoned in the Tower of London. What could go wrong? And the reality is, Edward wasn't necessarily actually running things in England. The real power reserved, reserved and um, lied with a Richard Neville, who was the Earl of Warwick. And that's why I'm going to refer to him from now on as Warwick, because it's easier than saying Richard Neville. So think, again, to use a Game of Thrones analogy, think of Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, as the hand of the king. While Edward is the actual king, Warwick is the one who's actually running things. He's the true statesman. He's the true one that's making everything run. Um, but the problem is, Edward IV didn't particularly like him or appreciate the amount of power or influence that he had. And so he ended up taking up decisions that would deliberately go against Warwick's kind of aim and ambitions. So this would lead Edward to do things like rushing hastily into marrying into a family that has ties to Lancastrian ancestry. And so, you know, you as Warwick, imagine yourself in this situation, you've been fighting a war for years against these Lancastrians and suddenly your own king then allies himself with somebody who has ties back to them generations ago. You know, that's going to make you feel uneasy. It's going to make the court feel uneasy, which it did. Um, Edward dismissed Warwick's own brother as Chancellor. And Warwick as well, again, was trying to do his best to avoid hostility and conflict with France. Basically just try and avoid being involved in the European theatre and generally. Um, and this meant that he signed a treaty with the King of France and was trying to avoid kind of having too close dealings with Burgundy. Edward immediately, after the treaty was signed, uh, renounced the treaty, scrapped it, and then allied himself with Burgundy, which outraged Warwick. And eventually, this led to Warwick um, rising up, essentially, in rebellion. Edward IV, though, uh, was victorious in the fight, and Warwick found himself also exiled to France, where not only did he find himself in the French court, but he also found himself uh, allying himself to none other than Queen Margaret herself. And so the two enemies, the two people who have been virtually attempting to wipe each other off for a good part of several years, now suddenly find themselves allied. And so the two of them, Queen Margaret and um, Warwick, find themselves back into France. They defeat Edward and they restore the crown back to Henry VI, where Edward then, it's his time to flee where he flees to Burgundy, where he had signed that, um, that alliance. And now, with Henry VI on the throne, Warwick then serves as his right-hand man, his lieutenant, you know, his hand of the king again, the true statesman. Um, however, Edward then returned back from Burgundy again, and with an army, and Warwick was slain in battle. While this is happening, Queen Margaret then attempted to try and flee to Wales this time, uh, where she would be safe, but she was intercepted by forces loyal to Edward, and her son was murdered. And at a similar time of this, Henry VI was then murdered in the Tower of London. And so at the present time, again, everything's coming up Millhouse. Edward IV is on, on the throne, and he would remain there, reign there until he died. Excuse me. Now, 
after he died, Edward had two sons. Edward V, and I can't remember the other name, and I apologise for that. Um, but here becomes a really controversial part in kind of the history, and, you know, people like Shakespeare and stuff like that exacerbated. But basically, Edward's brother, Richard, uh, lodged both of Edward's sons in the Tower of London, where they were declared illegitimate, and then the princes disappeared. Now, nobody actually knows for certain what happened to the princes. They're referred to as the princes in the tower. But general consensus is that they were murdered. Um, unknown whether Richard III himself murdered them or had them murdered or somebody else murdered them. Uh, nobody knows what happened for certain. Some people suggest that they escaped. But general consensus is that the two boy princes were murdered by their uncle. Or at least that's how history has kind of viewed it. And the thing is, Richard doing that and proclaiming himself king, Richard III, that alienated huge amounts of Yorkists. Because in their view, he had overthrown the rightful heirs and proclaimed himself king. And not only had he done that, but he'd done that to his own family. And so these Yorkists then flocked to the one remnant of Lancastrian heritage that they can find, which was one Henry Tudor, Henry the Seventh, as he would later be known as. And again, war kicks up again, and eventually Richard the Third is slain at the Battle of Bosworth, and uh, Henry the Seventh then proceeds to marry Edward the Fourth's daughter, and thus uniting the houses of York and Lancaster together, bringing an end to the War of the Roses. So that's the whistletop store of the War of the Roses. Again, it makes Game of Thrones look like a children's play, um, the amount of political intrigue. And I apologise if that was a bit ranty, I don't know how long that was, but it is such a key, important um, base for English history. And although it doesn't necessarily relate to Henry VIII precisely, I still think it's important to know about. So um, hopefully that hasn't distracted too much from the video, but let's, let's actually get back to the video now. Ding dong over which royal house should rule the realm. Finally, a Henry I, Henry VII, and he had a son. What should we name him? My royal lineage is full of Henrys. A fine name, a vigorous name, a tenacious name, a muscular name. How about Arthur? And so Arthur, Prince of Wales and next in line to the throne, was born. Five years later, Prince Henry was born, but nobody cares about him. He's not the heir, just a spare. The king wanted to make an alliance with Spain, so one day he said to his son Arthur, Hey, baby, you see that lady baby? That's gonna be your wife. But father, I'm not even three years old yet. Listen, there's something you have to understand. You're my son. But more than that, you're a political bargaining tool. But you love me, right? I love you as a political bargaining tool. Yay. Hey, Pop, who the heck are you? I've written you a poem. Listen here, tiny man. Can't you see that I'm busy, but I'm your son. I have another son? As Arthur was in another palace, being prepped to become king, Henry lived with his mother and two sisters at Eltham, where he was being trained for a church career. And not just that, Henry learnt languages. He played sports. He learnt the recorder. What a nerd. Am I right? Wrong. Henry was the coolest kid around. So I told my Latin teacher he could kiss us my buddy us. <laughs> anyway, here's Wonderwall. Great scholars and theologians from across Europe came to meet and teach the young Prince Henry, who by all accounts was a very enlightened, bright and charming young boy. Everybody loved Henry. And out of everything Henry was taught, more than anything, he came to adore and respect theology and Catholicism. One of Henry's tutors was English poet laureate John Skelton, who wrote a textbook for Henry that we still have today. In it, he wrote a number of important lessons for the young prince, such as, do not be mean, loathe gluttony, and do not violate widows. Important lessons for any nine-year-old boy. Around this time, Henry's older brother Arthur, now 15 years old, was married to Catherine of Aragon, sealing the union between England and Spain. And then he died. Oh, my alliance with Spain, my poor, poor alliance with Spain. And your son, sire? Oh, yes, of course, my son. But mostly my alliance with Spain. Hey, Pop, who the heck are you? Oh, yeah! And just like that, an unprepared Prince Henry was now the new heir to the throne. And how about that alliance with Spain? Well, the solution was simple. Hey, boy, see that full-grown woman over there? That's gonna be your wife. What, my brother's widow? Yes. 
You're a freaking weirdo, man. Now, in the Bible, there's a verse that says marrying your brother's widow, that's a big no-no. So the king needed to convince the pope and get his special permission. Hey, can I please have my son marry his brother's widow? Eh, sure, why not? And so it was. Henry's life was turned on its head as he was moved to the royal court, next in line to the throne. But tragedy struck when just a few months later, his mother, with whom he was very close, suddenly died in childbirth. The loss of his mother almost certainly had a big effect on the young. Okay, so while World of Tanks is playing, um, I'll just skip that. Okay, so just a quick thing there is um, Henry the Seventh. Although again, it's com it's uh, comedic with him mourning the death of the alliance with Spain. Uh, it's reported that Henry the Seventh actually took the death of his first son incredibly badly. He was. Uh, for the most part, reserved, calm, you know, reported to not really get emotional in front of anyone other than when he was angry. But apparently when his first son actually died, he was overcome with grief. He was openly sobbing. And when his wife died, Henry's mother, he found himself then um, locking himself away for days on end without talking to anybody at times. So I think the, the treatment of Henry VII is a little bit skiff, uh, scuffed a little bit. But Henry VIII was incredibly close with his mother as well, and nevertheless, her death um, undoubtedly affected him. Young boy. In his older years, King Henry VII went on a bit of a paranoid trip. As was normal for a king at the time, Henry VII had had to quell a number of rebellions, and as he aged, he became ever more suspicious of the nobility around him. To keep them in check, he began levying huge, ruinous fines, left, right, and center. Dukes, bishops, barons, even his own mother, no one was safe from his tyranny, and the nobility of England began to suffer. So when Henry VII finally got sick and died just after Christmas 1508, there was a lot of celebration. Not only because the tyrannical Henry VII was gone, but because his replacement was the ever popular, charming, and handsome 18-year-old King Henry VIII. Okay, so just quickly on that as well. So Henry VII um, employed widespreadly uh, things called justices of the peace, and while these kind of existed before, the way the easiest way to think of justices of the peace were these a kind of a precursor for a police force. So in every shire um, in England, essentially, for for those of you who don't know, shire is kind of like um area of land. So just think of it as in in every place where there's a town or a village or something like that, they had a justice of the peace, and basically he was there to ensure that. Anybody who broke the laws would, you know, make make sure everybody was obeying the law, basically. Um, but it was a voluntary position. And what this often meant as well was that people necessarily, it, it could be prone to corruption, but also people who wouldn't obey the laws, similar to what it said, found themselves getting fined or having other certain punishments levied against them and for nobility or people who were doing things wrong they found this incredibly annoying that they viewed that they couldn't do what they wanted to in their kind of their own land so to speak um i think henry the seventh even referred to it as uh, bastard feudalism so when after the war the roses and stuff like that there was these pockets as i said of these incredibly powerful people basically feeling like they could do whatever they wanted and Henry the Seventh kind of wanted to stamp the king's authority down and it was through things like the justices of the peace that such things happened but obviously when you're trying when you have very powerful influential and rich people suddenly when you start going you can't do that finding you can't do that finding you for what seems to be a minor and trivia things you're not exactly going to be very popular and so when Henry the Eighth come this charismatic young individual people were quite happy Henry married Catherine of Aragon in June 1509. You may be wondering, if it's so weird to marry your brother's widow, and since he's now king, couldn't Henry just decide not to? Well, yes, he could. But by now, Henry wanted to. The thing about Henry that was unlike many kings of the time was he married for love. And he'd grown quite fond of Catherine. Very fond. Historians say their marriage was unusually good. And so he was coronated king. And what a king. Compared to his tyrannical father, he was an absolute joy. Having the blood of two royal houses, he was widely supported. He was really, really ridiculously good looking. And those famous calves could achieve world peace. Hey Henry, now that you're king, you know what that means.
Costume party! Henry pranced around the palace playing dress up with his friends. He wrote plays. He sang songs. He danced. A true renaissance man, very different from the gluttonous wife killer we think of today. In his early reign, people from near and far would come to ask favors of the generous king. Hey man, could I gain ownership of some land near Upton Snodsbury? Sure thing, pal. Hey, could I be an earl or a baron or a viscount or something? Anything you want, man. Could I get, like, just, like, a really cool pig that has, like, freaking metal wings and eight legs and shoots flipping lasers and it can grow more pigs out of it for extra pigs? Say no more. Hey, guys, I was just checking up on the financial report and what the hell? We can't afford this. Henry's council that he inherited from his father weren't happy with all the money he was just throwing around, and they worked hard to curb the king's spending. Since they controlled the royal seals needed to get stuff done, at first they were largely able to control the young king. And for Henry, the most infuriating things of all was they wouldn't let him jest with his friends because it was too dangerous, nor would they let him do the thing he wanted most, to go on a great, glorious, and expensive conquest against England's historic enemy, France. Please guys, I'll keep it cheap. How? I'm glad you asked. I've got a promo code. Oh. For the financial burden of war? Oh, yes. Dear. Honey is the free browser extension. Okay. So while that's playing, I'll just give that mute. So, yeah. So as a common factor with young kings, particularly those that aren't necessarily trained for it from their birth, or even those that do train for it, generally speaking, uh, there's a habit of young kings, particularly young male kings, that when they come to power, they have extortionate spending. They spend a lot of money. Uh, money that they don't necessarily have. And one of the things as well, the one thing that's certain to drive up money and make money problems even worse, is war. Because people don't seem to think about it, but war is incredibly expensive. You are sending an army across the channel if you're English, or even generally, you know, that army still needs to march, that still needs to get, um, that, yeah, that army still needs to march, it still needs to get paid, it still needs to have food, um, otherwise, doesn't exactly go well, you know, some of the things like Rome, the city of Rome itself was once sacked because an army essentially didn't get paid, and so they decided they were just going to mutiny and then sack the city of Rome and steal everything and the soldiers pay for things themselves. So war is incredibly expensive. However, Henry VIII kind of has a a little ace up his sleeve in a certain individual, which we shall see, hopefully. Sexy cabs, excessive spending, and war with France. Henry wanted glory. He wanted to go down in history. If he didn't go to war in France, was he even the King of England? Man, I want to go to war so bad, but the council won't let me. Hey, maybe I can help with that. Whoa, it's Cardinal Wolsey. One of my best friends, despite being an old ass man, Cardinal Wolsey knew that if he helped King Henry, there'd likely be something in it for him. So what was his great, intricate plan to curb the council's power? You're the king, dum-dum. You can do whatever you want. What? Wolsey began writing bills that simply didn't require the seals, and thus, Henry was back on top. For his efforts, Wolsey began to climb the ranks, and he became something of a yes-man for King Henry, encouraging Henry to frolic and play while Wolsey took care of business. <laughs> hey, kid, you want to go on an adventure? Do I ever! The Pope was at war with France, and he needed some help. He offered the young, impressionable King Henry 100 Parmesan cheeses, some wine, and a golden rose if he came to the Pope's aid, and Henry was all in. At this point in his life, he still respected the church and loved the Pope, and here was the chance for war he had been waiting for. He still didn't have an heir, a fairly big problem for a monarch at the time, but right now, the only kind of smashing he was interested in was smashing French guys in the face. And so off he went. The English already held the French city of Calais. From there, Henry made a glorious victory at the Battle of the Spurs. He took the French cities of Terouan and Tournai. Word of his victory spread. This was it. Here was the glory he had been waiting for. Back home, his beautiful wife also led armies to victory in Scotland. And better yet, she was pregnant. Soon, Henry would have an heir. All of Henry's wildest dreams were coming true. Oh, he ran out of money. Yep. As the French prepared to invade Italy, all Henry could do was go home. Well, at least now I have an heir to cheer me up. Wow. Bring me my son. Henry, this is Mary. Mary? That's a funny name for a boy. Henry, it's a girl. Ah! 
This was Catherine's fifth pregnancy that had not resulted in a male heir. Happy Henry wasn't so happy anymore. You still haven't given me a male heir. Well, how do you know it's my problem? Maybe it's your problem, Henry. It couldn't be my problem because I've been boinking half your maid staff and one of them gave me a boy, uh, I mean, sure. Yeah, you know what? Maybe it's my problem. I'll look into that. Cardinal Wolsey, now Henry's Lord Chancellor, knew his job depended on keeping Henry happy. And so he said, well, if you can't be the great warrior, then how about the great peacemaker? Not as cool, but okay. And so the Field of the Cloth of Gold, a glamorous peace summit between England and France, was held. The King of France, Francis I, was essentially the French version of King yeah. Henry. And the whole thing very was similar. basically... Yeah, very similar in temperament and interests. Less wife killing, but yeah. And just briefly as well, that daughter mary is who would become mary the first or bloody mary as she's otherwise lean known um but yeah as i said so henry kind of at this stage having daughters is not ideal because sons are kind of what you want in the monarch game and henry isn't exactly having the best luck with those but also the war with france as well he done incredibly well with the war of france but again money is an issue and later when he would reinvade france he would have some great successes but again he would be let down by somewhat um other influences because coordination with uh, the hre or the, the holy roman empire as it was called then um wasn't particularly great they didn't really work together and as a result um a lot of the things that the HRE done well, their victories and their conquests, England couldn't capitalise on them because they weren't ready or weren't willing to act. And the same thing here is Henry VIII's victories that happened in France wasn't coordinated or the HRE were either absent or not willing to act on those. And so it kind of stifled into a, a nothingness. But that's, that's a few years ahead of this. But yeah, essentially English Henry VIII meets French Henry VIII only with less wife killing one giant codpiece measuring contest. The two sides did agree to a peace treaty. However, it didn't last long. You see, there was a third major player in European politics at the time, an exquisite specimen of royal inbreeding, an heir to a huge inheritance, and a chin that could hit a home run. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. He was Henry's wife's nephew. Henry had helped him out in the past to put down a Spanish rebellion, and now the two wanted to make an alliance, and so a marriage was arranged. Mary, I'd like to introduce you to your 22-year-old fully grown adult cousin, and now your future husband. Ew, he looks inbred. Mary! We're all inbred. Yeah, I mean, that is the joke that um, monarchy and stuff like that is inbred. And to an extent, large amounts of them were. However, the Hasbergs take it to a, another level entirely. In that, well, it led to things like that where people had massive chins, huge amounts of deformity because that was the scale of inbred. You know, it's, it's one thing for monarchs to then marry their cousins or second cousins and stuff like this. But when you're having much closer levels of inbreeding on consecutive generations, then you end up with situations like the Hasbergs where they have a, a huge chin turned into the crimson chin. With their new alliance, Charles and Henry agreed to team up and relaunch a campaign against France. In 1522, the English landed and stormed as far south as Agincourt, but Charles didn't commit significant forces. Whoops, sorry man, not sure what happened. I'll join in next year. The next year, England swept northern France, almost taking Paris. But once again, where was Charles? Oh man, I'm so sorry. I promise, next year, I'll be there. The next year came, and a fed up Henry decided he was going to sit this one out. And just as Charles ravaged the French at the Battle of Pavia and captured the French king. Holy crap, dude. Yeah, I totally kicked France's butt. That's great. So, can I have the French throne like we agreed? Mm, no. What? And also, I don't want to marry your ugly daughter anymore. It, ugly? Have you seen your chin? Mummy says it's a strong chin for a strong boy. As Henry's alliance with Charles fell apart, Henry knew his days as a warrior were over. This was a problem for Henry, but it was a bigger problem for his wife. Yeah. Catherine of Aragon had two jobs. The first was to give Henry a male heir, but the second was to maintain an alliance with her relatives in Spain, including her nephew. She had failed and Henry's sexy eyes began to wander. Home from all his wars, Henry ate up his daily 5,000 calories of meat as an infatuation began to grow for one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. Beautiful, intelligent, cultured. She was exactly Henry's type. Now, Henry had had dozens of mistresses, including Anne's sister, but Anne didn't want to just be Henry's side chick. She wanted to be his queen. 
Henry sent dozens of letters, thirsty love poems. In one, he proclaimed that he would like to kiss her pretty duckies. Henry's loins were on fire, but Anne kept him at just the right distance to drive him crazy and push him to find a way to get rid of his current wife. Wolsey, I want a divorce. And as the representative of the Pope here in England, I expect you to sort it out quickly and quietly. I don't want this to turn into a Europe-wide scandal. You got it, your majesty. Hey, Big Papa! My boy Henry says he wants to divorce his wife. Any chance? This is okay. a Smile Direct Club. So, uh... So, yeah, so divorce is a big no-no. Um, and especially when it becomes a pawn in wider uh, geopolitical events, which is kind of what Henry VIII would be caught up in. So, not having a son again as I said is a big problem um, and then you know her also failing to kind of secure that alliance with Spain with Charles the fifth wasn't exactly brilliant um, and so yeah Henry's eyes begin to wander not for the first time to Anne Boleyn and he wants to marry her but obviously he's married already so he needs to get divorced and so this becomes the thing, and as we all know, or as some of us actually might not know, is this gets denied, and this leads to the breakaway from Catholicism in England. Helps if I actually unpause the video. There we go. Wolsey deferred the case back to the Pope in Rome. To make matters worse, after all the wars in Europe, the Pope was currently under the thumb of Charles V. Now everybody knew what was going on, and Henry's divorce trial had become a pawn of greater European politics. For Wolsey, the decision was a disaster. His job was to keep Henry happy, and Henry was very, very unhappy. Nevertheless, the divorce trial began. Henry's case rested upon the Bible verse in Leviticus that claimed marrying your brother's widow would lead to childlessness, and Henry was certainly having a hard time getting a male heir. He argued that the Pope had got it wrong when he allowed Henry to marry his brother's widow, and that now divorce was the only solution. However, the Pope and Charles V acquired some interesting letters from an unknown source. He wants to kiss her pretty duckies? Man, this guy's loins are on fire! The Pope now knew the case for divorce may not actually be found in Henry's Bible, but in Henry's pants. After escaping Charles V, the Pope did send out one Cardinal Campaggio to oversee the trial. Campaggio was an old man racked with gout. It took him six painful months to travel from Rome to England, and when he finally got there, this kept happening. Hey, I need you to take a look at this evidence. I can't. My gout is acting up. Hey, are you ready to take my testimony? I can't. My gout is acting up. Hey, can you please make a decision? I can't. Your gout is acting up. My gout is acting up. Anne Boleyn, with her Protestant views and support of the Reformation, suspected the Pope was just delaying. For two whole years, the trial dragged on and on, and in the end, the Pope simply said, no, no divorce for you, Henry. So there's a, there's a few things here. So already, for one, uh, Henry trying to use that kind of this statement saying that if he married his brother's wife then that would lead to childlessness of course he had a daughter but in wider kind of political terms or broader sense a uh, daughter didn't necessarily count for much and so essentially childless still in henry's mind view and so with that you then had those letters appear um, and it's still not entirely concrete on how those letters came to come about it could be a aid of Anne Boleyn it could be uh, an aid of Henry VIII himself but eventually they found them and so the kind of the case to throw that out then suddenly goes out the window when it becomes apparent that it's not so much about theological uh, decisions but more about uh, matters of the flesh so to speak and uh, so that didn't exactly help his case either especially considering that the woman that he wrote those letters to, Anne Boleyn, uh, was very clearly a president. She supported the Reformation and stuff like that from Martin Luther. Uh, so again, not exactly big happy uh, situation going on with that, if you allow that to happen, because then that creates a whole slew of other issues anyway. And so eventually the, the request to divorce is denied. However, that wouldn't be the end of it, as we shall see. 
the king that had previously defended the Pope militarily from France and intellectually from the reformist ideas of Martin Luther, who had once respected the Pope above all, now found the Pope standing between him and fourth base. Your Majesty, what will you do? I'm the king, dum-dum. I can do whatever I want. What? For his failure, Henry removed Wolsey from the court, a decision that was likely influenced by Anne Boleyn, who disliked the cardinal. Having fallen from grace and with potential charges of treason over his head, Wolsey died of illness a year later. Then, Henry set about removing England from the influence of the Pope. Hey, if you do that, I'll excommunicate you. Who cares, man? Oh no, apathy. My weakness! Henry gathered theologians and scholars together to help him make his case against the Pope. Together, they argued to the people of England that the Pope's rule over the Church was basically a takeover of what had once been a self-governing, national, English Church. And if that sounds familiar, some historians do believe this moment may have laid the foundations for English Euroscepticism. That's right, Brexit may have been influenced by Henry's explosive loins. So, again, so... I think personally, in, in where I fall in that personal opinion, is that's a bit of a stretch. Um, however, it is interesting to think about the reason why, uh, historically speaking, that England has viewed itself as different than uh, than Europe. You know, you, you only need to talk necessarily to English people, and there's a real divide between those who consider themselves to be European and those who consider themselves to be English or British. Um, and again, that's reflected really in the foreign policy. Uh, kind of going forward with England's treatment towards um, the continent, you know, uh, not allowing one strong, solid power to dominate the continent, but to keep them uh, closely poised and balanced so that they could still exert their influence without having to actually be physically involved there. So it's an interesting thought, but for me personally speaking, I think to link Brexit all the way back to Henry VIII is a little bit of a stretch. Um, but, yeah, so severed the ties uh, with the papal states, essentially. By and large, the people gave Henry their support, and those that didn't were going to be in for a rough time. Yeah. But for now, Henry assumed the role of supreme head of the English church, and his next divorce trial was a foregone conclusion. Catherine of Aragon was Aragon, and Anne Boleyn was in. All right, I've upended the entire country to be with you, so you'd better give me a son, okay? Now, did you get my letter about the duckies? Having finally married the girl of his dreams, it was party time for Henry. And what a party. Life in the Tudor court was non-stop. Huge banquets, with each person eating on average 5,000 calories a day. And no vegetables. Those are for poor people. Yeah. Rich people ate meat. And so you know what else is for rich people? Constipation. But don't let that stop the party. The toilets are communal. And Henry himself was the center of everything. He ate the best food. He had 1,200 pairs of shoes. He didn't even have to wipe his own bum bum. Life was great. Everyone, I give you your majesty, King Henry VIII. But how did they pay for it all? Well, influenced by his fairly Protestant new wife, since Henry had overturned the organization of the church, this is how they paid for it. Oh my goodness, how awful. Selling fake fragments of the cross? Vials of Jesus' blood that you got from a duck? Using religion in this way? This is terrible. I must confiscate all this money at once. Yes, how awful. I must take all of this away immediately. Monasteries across the nation were dissolved and their riches placed in the royal coffers. Okay, so this is called the dissolution of the monasteries. So when Henry VIII broke away from uh, the Catholic Church, he established the Church of England. Now, the thing is, again, with the extortionate spending and things like that, he then thought, how could he get money? And one of the such ways that he got this money was the dissolution of the monasteries. And so he went round, first of all, to monasteries who were making below a certain threshold. I can't remember the exact amount. But those monasteries who were making below a certain threshold, he then um, essentially confiscated all the property. And it came directly under ownership of the crown. Um, now, the problem is this. Well, I mean, there's many problems with this, for one. But one of the major problems with it was that it annoyed a lot of people. Because while the whole separation away from uh, the Catholic Church and stuff like that was supported by Henry VIII, obviously, because it suited him, there was still a lot of people who were not necessarily happy that it happened. You know, uh, 
Um, and so you would have, first of all, with the dissolution of the monasteries, you'd have monks and stuff like that. The people who lived and worked in these places would perhaps be offered a pension, you know, a small pension so they could do something and transition, uh, depending on their age, to, to a different place. Um, but then eventually something happened which was called the Great Pilgrimage. And this was essentially predominantly in the north of England, where lots of people, not just abbots or um, priests or nuns, but, you know, general regular people um, protested this. You know, they, they didn't like the idea that monasteries were being torn down and kind of got rid of or um, forced into well, forced into not being monasteries, basically. There was rumours at the time as well that they might tax things like baptisms and stuff like that, which, again, annoyed more people. And it was kind of a manifestation as well into other more uh, social and economic issues, as well as the, the kind of attack on what they deemed as their faith, so to speak. And so when this happened, um, a large number of people protested. And I think, if I'm correct, uh, accounts remark that things happened you know tens of thousands of people turned up to this protest i think the the highest estimate is around 50,000 between like 40 and 50,000 people turned up uh, to protest against this and eventually what this meant was all the ringleaders uh, all the ringleaders of this protest were rounded up and executed um, you know you had vicars abbot vicars abbots priests nuns lords a few lords who were involved in it who supported it necessarily uh, knights themselves were executed through a manner of whole different ways burnt at the stake beheaded hung drawn and quartered and suddenly kind of from this point henry the eighth view monasteries as a potential attack on himself or potential place for anti-government sedition and so this meant that the dissolution of the monasteries then scowled up and suddenly you had um people going round to monasteries uh, regardless of really how much they earn and then they would demand a surrender um, what this meant was you'd have someone like a, a royal commissioner who were specifically um, hired for this role would go up to the abbey or wherever um, place this might be so monastery or abbey but namely abbeys and they would demand a surrender and what this essentially means is that all the people kind of inside uh, the abbey would surrender their kind of goods their, their ground um, or they would die essentially and uh, numerous abbots were put to death they were executed and those in areas where the surrender didn't happen um, the monks that wasn't murdered or slaughtered on mass in these things would then suddenly find themselves without a job without a home without a pension or anything really to show for it and this is kind of this is really a huge starting point for what Henry VIII is kind of remembered for in being this tyrannical uh, megalomaniac because of the widespread executions that happened I mean obviously people remember his wife that he killed but throughout the dissolution of the monasteries and onwards it's estimated that at least 50 odd thousand people were executed under his reign with that kind of being like the low estimate, you know, estimates as high as 80 odd thousand people being put to death um, through the dissolution of monasteries and through the powers uh, invested through the royal commissioners. And then later um, through things like the Star Chamber and stuff like that, which was essentially a court to cut through the courts. You know, it was a it was a court made up of basically his closest kind of um, compatriots. Uh, he established which could essentially just cut through all the legality of actual courts and then well I mean can you say corruption because that's how corruption happens but again jumping way ahead but dissolution of monasteries obviously many people weren't too happy about this but Henry had a plan for that as well Henry's descent into yep. tyranny had begun as any who rejected his new claim as supreme head of the English church found their heads on the chopping block and so Henry partied. He danced. He sang. He ate. He jousted. Be me. Love gluttony. Violate widows. 
1536, Henry fell from his horse in a jousting accident. Not for the first time, but certainly the heaviest fall he had taken yet. Some historians believe the brain damage caused by the incident may have violently accelerated Henry's descent into tyranny. Executions in England ramped up. During his reign, it's estimated 57 to 72,000 people were put to death. Yep. Rich or poor, big or small, no one was safe. And the most prominent victim of all was to be Henry's own wife. It had been three years since their marriage. Anne had been pregnant four times, yet she had only been able to produce one healthy child, a girl. What's more, it's possible she had been going around insulting Henry's manhood. Henry's eyes, once again, began to wander. He so just quickly as well, that Elizabeth, that daughter, would be Elizabeth I eventually. Because, spoiler alert, um, there's three children born of Henry, legitimately at least. Um, and all of them would sit the, king, uh, sit the throne for a time. Um, but Elizabeth I is probably the most well-known, Elizabeth I, uh, Elizabeth the Virgin, which is why uh, Virginia is called what it is, because it was named in her honour. An extra little fun fact for you. His new top man, Thomas Cromwell, didn't want to end up like Cardinal Wolsey, and so he came up with a plan. There was a court musician who had been quite flirtatious in public with the Queen. Well, Thomas Cromwell and his boys got a forced confession out of him, saying that it didn't stop at innocent flirtation, and the charges came rolling in. Listen, Anne, we need to talk. Oh no, you're gonna divorce me, aren't you? Just like your last wife. Oh, n no, come here, shh, no. I'm not gonna divorce you. It's much worse than that. Anne was charged with adultery, perversion, even incest, and plotting to kill the king himself. The jury found her guilty, including her own uncle and ex-fiancé, both fearing the wrath of the king. And on May 19th, 1536, Anne Boleyn was Anne Bolat. Literally the next day, Henry married one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Jane Seymour. Okay, so just quickly here as well. Um, talking about the trials and things like this, um, I've taken part in a research study, and it's incredibly hard to disprove those things when you are accused of them, particularly women. Um, I said for, for this, it's there, there's a lot of suspicion that a lot of the trumps that were kind of... Um, Put against uh, Anne Boleyn weren't actually true, weren't actually accurate. Um, they were just a way to basically get her out of the way easily. And the easiest way, rather than going through a, a divorce and all of this, was to simply say that she's cheated on him, she's accused of treason, she's incestual, and various other charges, all of which, incidentally, on their own, would carry the death penalty. So suddenly then you throw on a load of extra ones all together, and suddenly it's just like, oh well gotta die um so there's a lot of suspicion and given how quickly henry remarried the exact uh the day after the execution leads you to suspect well weren't exactly um worrying about it was he um and y yeah it it's that it's that problem is when you're married to the king he says you're cheating on him how do you disprove that it's a similar way of there is an awful lot of women who were put to death uh kind of up to the 1600s through till the 1700s even early into 1800s where i've read through the court trials themselves where women or neighbors who are jealous would accuse other women or neighbors of things like bestiality and bestiality itself would carry the death penalty. Um, and so you'd have a neighbour would accuse a neighbour that they were jealous of, or perhaps they was worried about their husband's faithfulness or something. And she would simply say, yeah, the neighbour, I saw the neighbour having intercourse with a cat. I was about to go, but I don't know the age of people watching this. But um, yeah, they, they would say, I saw the neighbour having intercourse with that cat or that dog. And bring it to court and obviously it then lies with the woman to then try and disprove the fact that she didn't and then it led to some really strange situations where they would have the woman and then the animal that was accused as well because the animal was also under trial here and if the animal was shown to recognize the person accused then that was good enough and more often than not both the person accused and the animal were put to death and so it's that type of thing of, I'm sorry, that's a very morbid fact to you, but it, it points to the fact of how do you disprove these things? And the answer is for Anne Boleyn, there was simply no way 
of disproving that. If she had done them, obviously, then that that's another issue entirely. But, you, but if she hadn't, and there is a fair amount of evidence that she hadn't, then she was in a no-win situation anyway. And here is Jane Seymour, who wildly renounced while he was had a favourable marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Jane Seymour seems to be, um, in terms of consensus, his favourite wife. And that reason will be revealed so- shortly. His third wife. After Anne had smack-talked his manhood, and since he still had no male heir, Henry went on a campaign to ensure the public knew he was as virile as it gets. He had this famous portrait painted of the manliest man I've ever seen, and later, he would even have his physician make a declaration about his health. King Henry is a fine specimen of a man, and... Ugh, please don't make me say this. Say it? <sighs> and every time I look at him... I wish I was a woman. The truth is, after his jousting accident, the king had badly injured his leg and was no longer very active, yet he was still eating his daily 5,000 calories. So by now, Henry was extremely unhealthy. For the remainder of his life, he would incur a number of illnesses, and his injured leg ulcers would ooze stinking pus. A fine specimen of a man indeed. On the church front, Henry's new and now pregnant wife was a devout Catholic, and she pleaded with the king to reinstate the monasteries. Henry was sick of wives meddling in his business, and he bluntly warned her to remember what happened to Anne Boleyn. Since splitting with the Pope, Henry had been hard at work determining the theology of his new Church of England. It kept many Catholic traditions, while on the other hand embracing some reformist ideas, such as requiring the use of a new Bible not in Latin, but in English. The cover of Henry's new Bible depicted the people appearing to worship a giant King Henry. And in the corner, there's some people being put to death, just for good measure. For any who opposed Henry's ideas, whether Catholic or Protestant, for any who rebelled against him, it would be off with their heads. In October 1537, Henry finally got what he had been waiting for. His wife Jane gave birth to a healthy boy. However, the triumph soon turned to tragedy, as Jane Seymour died days later from complications during the birth. Henry mourned Jane, the woman who had given him a son for two years. Your Majesty, it's time to choose your next wife. Thomas! Not now! Can't you see I'm in mourning? That one. The woman Thomas Cromwell had lined up for Henry's next marriage was the sister of a powerful German duke. But all Henry cared about was that she was pretty as pie, and Thomas Cromwell promised that indeed she was. However, when she arrived in England, Henry was less than pleased. Your Majesty, let me introduce you to your fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Wh what's that smell? Uh, I think it's your leg, sire. No, it's Anne of Cleves. She's ugly. This is treason. What? Off with his head! Henry found his new wife so repulsive that he never consummated the marriage, and divorced her just six months later. And for bringing Henry an ugly, stinky woman, along with additional charges of plotting treason, Thomas Cromwell lost his head. The very same day of Cromwell's execution, Henry married his fifth wife, the famed beauty Catherine Howard. She's believed to have only been 17 at the time. Henry was 49, and like Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard didn't last long. You see, for some reason she may not have been entirely satisfied with her 49-year-old fine specimen of a man, and it's possible she engaged in a number of extramarital affairs, including one with her cousin, Thomas Culpepper. When Henry found out, he was devastated. How could she do this to me? But sire, don't you have hundreds of mistresses? Shut up, Barry, that's not the point. <laughs> your majesty, you're crying. I'm not crying. It's just that sometimes, when I get sad, water comes out of my eyes! For her treason, Catherine Howard met the same fate as Anne Boleyn in 1542. So, we've had divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded... Survived. Um, spoiler alert. But yeah, uh, again, it is... With Anne of Cleves, it seems to be like Henry VIII had the earliest form of catfishing where he was shown a portrait of which uh, deemed very attractive to her and when he uh, when she arrived she was deemed utterly unsatisfactory towards him and again because of this uh, Thomas Cromwell uh, got the block and then you have um, this lady oh, I've completely forgotten her name even though it just mentioned it there um, but again yeah it's that strange double standard as well that seems to resist that kings have numerous mistresses sometimes very them are uh, sometimes uh, some of them are extremely well known as well and there's no um, 
secrecy involved in it and yet the concept that uh, the queen herself might engage in similar thing is completely outrageous but then again i suppose then that leads to issues of who's the actual rightful heir you don't want to bastard heir or anything like that um and so it's understandable from that respect but is quite interesting because at the same time the same way that henry the eighth could hire uh, sire bastard that could be an equal uh, issue with succession of which uh, it was reflected in numerous other historical events not necessarily in england but certainly on the continent um and then yeah i'm spoiled it already but the sixth wife the sixth wife of henry the eighth will be the one that survives that outlives henry the eighth himself Look out, here comes Survive. Henry married the daughter of a royal official, Catherine Parr, in 1543, and she appears to have been a good companion to Henry. She cared for the aging king, who by now was so heavy it took several men to winch him onto his horse. She acted as a mediator within the family and convinced the king to restore his two daughters to the line of succession. Their marriage did have one hiccup, however, when Catherine dared disagree with the king over the subject of theology. It's a miracle because when the priest says the words of institution, the bread turns into the body of Christ. Well, if you put the bread in a box for three months, is it a miracle that it turns moldy? <gasps> Treason! You can't just call everything treason, Henry. The king called for her arrest as serious charges were placed over her head. However, in the end, she told Henry that she had not been disagreeing with him, but simply learning from him. And so when the guards came to arrest her, the king told them to make like an M and cleave. Catherine Parr stayed with Henry right until the end. As he aged into his later years, in increasing pain and ill health, he grew ever more suspicious and moody. The once generous, promising young king was now feared by all around him. Yeah. Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Hold me. Of course, sire. Do you have any final wishes? Uh, how, uh, how about... How about one last conquest in France? And so in 1544, Henry made for Calais. The pesky French had been supporting the Scottish in their ongoing wars with England, and they also owed Henry some money. So the extremely unhealthy king personally led a siege against the French city of Boulogne. The English dug tunnels under the castle, and on the 13th of September, the French surrendered. A glorious victory for Henry. In actuality, the whole misadventure nearly bankrupt England, and they ended up giving Boulogne back to the French a few years later. But shh, don't tell Henry. He's having his moment. Finally, in 1547, a 55-year-old Henry, lapsing in and out of consciousness, passed away. His son, Edward, succeeded him, but died just five years later. Yeah. Edward, when he uh, was succeeded, another Edward, again, if that didn't confuse you enough at the beginning with the War of the Roses, but he was quite a sickly child, and he died very young. Uh, he was on the only on the throne, as I said, for uh, a number of years. And then he himself was succeeded by Mary I, who could have an entire oversimplified, oversimplified video herself, because unlike her father, Mary I was Catholic. Um, however, she is known as Bloody Mary, because similar to her father, she put numerous people to death via executions, burning at the stakes, etc., etc. And then she herself was, well, succeeded by Elizabeth I, where people sometimes say the golden age um you know that had numerous things like the spanish armada you had of course um people finding v uh, virginia sir francis drake and various other uh, manners like that his daughter mary briefly took the reins and steered the country back towards the pope but then his second daughter embraced reformist ideas and gradually transformed england into a protestant country Henry's desperation to marry Anne Boleyn and his resulting feud with the Pope had changed the course of English history and religion forever. Unfortunately, none of Henry's children had heirs, and when Elizabeth I died, Henry's lineage ended, with the House of Stuart replacing the House of Tudor. So then you might think, all that effort, a life filled with so much frustration, yet he never conquered France, he barely had a male heir, and his lineage died out. The egotistical man Henry grew sick and cruel, and then died. So why are we all so fascinated with King Henry VIII? Why not Henry II or IV? Well, without mentioning the many important things his reign did achieve, one of his biggest goals was to go down in history. And you can put a big green check beside that one. Because everything he did, and how he asserted his control and authority over everyone around him, has come to be viewed as the epitome of the word king. And also because of the wife killings? Yeah, definitely the wife killings. Okay, so that's the end of that video. 
Um, I think to an extent, the ending of that video where they're talking about why you remember him is true. You know, the authority, the absolute disregard, really, of people who opposed him and his sheer will and uh, almost pigheadedness of what he wanted uh, is really what you think of King. However, again, I think a large reason of why he's remembered is because of the terrible things that he done. You know, the, the murder of his wife's for one, having six of them is another thing entirely, yet alone killing two. Um, you know, the wars, you know, people have wars. But, yeah, I think generally speaking, he's remembered for two reasons, and that is the, the separation from the Catholic Church and having six wives and killing two of them. And I think generally speaking... We remember people who do bad things um, a lot easier than those that kind of just drift by. You know, I can think of kings now, you know, from all the way from William the Conqueror to um, to modern day Queen Elizabeth, that kind of that line of kings and queens. And yet, although I can kind of name them all, there are a few kings and queens scattered around the place where I'm just like, which one, which one is he again? He did what? And... But the thing is, you say Henry VIII, everyone knows Henry VIII. Everyone knows six wives, killed two of them, was a fat lad. Um, you know, wars with France, separated from the church. Um, you know, isn't really up for debate or people are just like, who's Henry VIII? Um, and I think that's generally the way that history remembers people. People, he, history undoubtedly, I mean, I think it's changing now. Um, in my opinion, not necessarily for the better, the way it's taught in schools in more of a history from below. I think there's room certainly for both of more traditional learning about the influential individuals and the wider political events rather than just history from below, in my personal opinion. Um, but people will always remember the individuals who do things that undoubtedly change the course of histories and the path of either nations or continents. You know, Henry VIII undoubtedly regardless of what he done or whether you approve of it undoubtedly changed the course of england for ever and that's something that you can't say about a lot of people so i'm looking at the recording thing this is probably this is well it's not probably this is the longest video that i have ever done so if you've made it this far thank you very much uh i hope you aren't asleep and as always if you have any recommendations for me to have a look at and give us a shout otherwise thank you very much for watching see you around stay safe thank you bye bye